In the past few years as part of this community, I have consistently heard and felt a sentiment. That being that YouTube is nothing more than a sinking ship, and that if we are all to survive, we need to band together, pack up our things, and push our communities elsewhere. To create our own clone of YouTube, where instead of being ran by a corporation like Google, a select few YouTube elite take the reins. And whenever I hear stories like that, frankly, all I can really think is... Good luck with that, guys! No, no, I'm gonna stay here! Hidden deep within the history of the internet is a cautionary tale about what happens when a select few are given massive power with little to no chance of public outcry. It's a story of betrayal, abuse of power, and an idiot savant attitude that led to the birth and fall of an obscure yet powerful online empire. It's a story that not many will tell you. Not because it's a secret or it's hidden, but because most have forgotten. But I remember. Oh, do I remember. In fact, you could say that I remember specifically, so you don't have to. Full disclosure, I have always planned to cover this topic. In fact, up to about five days ago, I had planned for this video to be the finale to this series. I wanted this to be the final Fallen Titans I ever made. I've moved it up on my schedule for reasons that will become obvious. Throughout this video, I'm going to be discussing three things. Firstly, the history of ThatGuyWithTheGlasses.com and how it all started. Secondly, what happened when the site became Channel Awesome and how that version fell into obscurity. And thirdly, the allegations that have come out against the men that ran these sites. Many of these come from a 70-page document which was just released, written by notable producers who were once hosted on the site, and while a select few might find this controversial, I am going to be treating these as facts. I know that some of you are going to argue that all allegations should be presumed to be lies, but these are frankly substantiated accounts from people who worked on the site who are heavily respected to this day, and I see no reason to try and cherry-pick which ones we believe are true and which ones we believe are lies. Furthermore, it should be noted that despite having the chance, Channel Awesome has not debunked any of these points. Instead, they simply stated, we sincerely regret that you felt that way. Which is close to the worst apology I've ever read. Anyways, on to the history of the site. In the last episode of Fallen Titans, we briefly touched upon the creation of YouTube, which was invented by three PayPal employees who were disgruntled about the lack of places online to host videos. What happens next in the story is three significant things. For one, the website became immediately popular but was constantly losing money due to how much it cost to keep all these videos streaming at once. For two, they were threatened with numerous lawsuits due to the massive amounts of copyright infringement. And for three, Google purchased the platform for billions of dollars and made it their goal to fix both of these problems, no matter the cost. Enter Doug Walker, a small-time commentary creator who started uploading content around mid-2007. His YouTube channel focused on three main shows. An in-universe discussion series about his childhood called The Nostalgia Critic, a series of clipless rant videos written from the perspective of Bum and about current films, and a series where Doug would post a clip from the film, usually with little more than an added caption introducing it. Doug Walker would instantly grow a following on YouTube, but tragedy would literally strike when his channel was taken down over his five-second movies uploads. Meaning that he would essentially have to start over knowing that at any time his channel could be taken down, seemingly, for no reason. That being, unless he left. Which was an option back then. You have to understand that despite the early introduction of the ads program, it was very hard to get your content monetized on early YouTube. Only a select few were chosen to be Google partners, and because of this, it became very common for other content creators to move to YouTube's head competitor, Blip.tv, which was a video streaming website meant to be used to host videos on other websites. It was this window of opportunity that led to the grand opening of ThatGuyWithTheGlasses.com the proud home of the Nostalgia Critic. However, the creators of this site had in their vision a much grander plan. They envisioned a website that would garner daily traffic. Visitors coming every single day to see content creators similar in style to Doug Walker. And this decision led to them seeking out and recruiting other online reviewers to fill in the website's charter. These days, to survive for an extended period of time on YouTube, change is a necessity. You have to be able to evolve to set yourself apart from other content creators. When it comes to things like reviews, memorable creators who are rising in the ranks all find their own ways of discussing film and television. 
Creators like me, Your Movie Sucks, Ralph the Movie Maker, Jenny Nicholson, I Hate Everything, and Garf Gab all discuss film and television in their own unique voices and with their own unique styles of video. And we survive on this platform and respect each other because of this. And that's why the story of that guy with the glasses.com, at least to me, is so mesmerizing. To end up on Walker's roster of content creators, you had to have a very similar style of discussing film. And instead of finding their own voice from the get-go, most of the content creators were first preoccupied with finding a gimmick. As I mentioned, in the early days, the Nostalgia Critic limited himself to media from his own childhood, and all of the other creators invited to the site were expected to find their own gimmicks to set themselves apart from Doug. The Nostalgia Chick, Lindsay Ellis, reviewed girly media from Doug Walker's childhood. Todd in the Shadows examined music and media connected to music. Linkara reviewed comics and other nerdly products that he was fond of. The Rap Critic did, well, take a guess, and the cinema snob reviewed porn. I think you get the idea. This standard was set in place to the extent that when two content creators reviewed the same movie, there was a feeling of scandal. Many of the crossover segments, which have now aged very poorly, featured the various creators fighting over who had the right to review said product. There were scenes of the nostalgia critic telling the nostalgia chick to stick to girly products instead of reviewing films meant for boys, and of creators jumping into other reviews to say that the video wasn't needed because it had already been covered by someone else. This was an atmosphere where two people were not allowed to watch the same movie. That is insane. There was a point partway into the history of this site where Lindsay Ellis and The Amazing Atheist were uploading virtually the same content to the website. Two people whose content is now wholly evolved away from each other, into different audiences and different cliques, were both posting videos for the same audience about similar topics in a semi-imitation of the work of Doug Walker. Not to imply that these creators failed to make an impression or set themselves apart from one another. Indeed, many of them would make up for the cookie-cutter style of their commentary by choosing unique personalities to present to these audiences. And through this tactic, they still managed to find a way to make an impact. In fact, I will directly state that Todd in the Shadows has always been, and will always continue to be, one of my main inspirations for discussing media online. But my point is simply that many of these producers were actively encouraged to stay inside a very limited field of creativity up until the point that they left the site. Now, discussions of videos hosted on thatguywiththeglasses.com can be reasonably difficult, mainly because many of these videos just don't exist anymore. Years after the start of the website, and by all accounts, thousands of videos in, the hosting website blip officially closed its doors. And no one really had enough care to catalog and download all of the videos hosted on this site, and even those who did, didn't exactly have anywhere to post them. Doug Walker left YouTube because he felt that it wasn't a place where fair use existed, and he sought out to create an environment where fair use was always at play. But what he actually ended up doing was creating a place where copyright was never enforced, whether the use was legal or not. I'm going to flat out say what some of you are already thinking. Despite his protests, the five second movie series is the antithesis to what we now see as fair use. And many of the choices made by content creators back in the day are now entirely frowned upon, such as when Linkar would play entire songs in his outro crawl or when the site hosted actual Jink-style reaction content. His daughter has a different motif, where she's just like, with my hair back at both. In defense of these creators, without legal precedent and without YouTube having a coherent system, understanding fair use is next to impossible. But it's still hard to watch clips of these creators discussing what they consider to be fair use, especially under the context of what their videos were. Even though technically my work is protected by satire parody clause. I told you I was protected by satire parody clause. But you didn't listen. But Mr. Glass, don't those media moguls know that you're giving them free press and free advertising for their movies? And I've made these film studios so much money giving them free advertising and free publicity. There are so many people who don't even give a shit about your movies until they see my version in five seconds. Their solution is to have people not look at their product and not to increase their sales. All your people care about is not getting the word out, not getting people to look at your product. Where's the fair use? For the most part, Doug Walker's reviews served as a replacement for the experience of watching a film. In many cases, he failed to change the tone or context of the clips that he was showing, and he often ate up the potential audience of various films. His review of The Room was infamously taken down by Tommy Wiseau, 
and while many at the time herald Doug as a champion of free speech, in a modern context it's easy to see how this comedy video wasn't exactly transformative. Most content creators on Blip.com believed in the anything that's funny is fair use clause, which doesn't exist. And it was taken down because your studio claimed copyright infringement, even though it's so obviously a review, so it's covered by fair use as well as satire parody clause. Ha 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 the officer was so filmed, and any footage you used to tell me was so is hurting his good image! I feel like I'm forgetting something. Oh fuck, the movies. So partially to celebrate the annual success of the site, and partially to strengthen the bonds between the numerous content creators, the men behind ThatGuyWithTheGlasses.com would fund and produce numerous crossover specials. The actors would be flown out to various locations to shoot scenes in character, written by someone who apparently failed to understand what their characters were actually supposed to be like, and any content which the actors filmed on the trip was given directly to the hands of the producers, so that they could personally upload and monetize these reviews. Meaning that not only were the numerous producers involved in the process dedicating their precious time to working on the film, but they were also essentially paying someone to let them be in this movie. These films could actively be compared to The Room, not only because they're horrible movies, but also because they were flagged by some of the same production errors. The most notable cases involve actors being held in hot environments for inappropriately long periods of time between filming, and the filmmakers having to be told that they needed to supply water on set. A lot of this happened during the film that was shot in the Nevada desert. This is almost certainly what led to an actress passing out mid-filming. The people involved in the films were constantly injured on these sets, and in fact one of the only reasons that contracts were actually signed was so that the people in charge could not be held liable. When one actress who was brought in last minute injured her knee, the crew forced her to sign one of these contracts after the fact to avoid legal ramifications. These are not things that you are supposed to do. The only difference between the production of The Room and the Channel Awesome anniversary films is that the people who made The Room were actually paid. Meanwhile, people involved with The Nostalgia Critic and Friends often worked on their own time without reimbursement, and despite this they were often met with a snobbish, mean girls-like atmosphere. There's this feeling early on that these films were justifiable to these creators because there was a sense of teamwork. But over the years as the scripts got meaner and meaner and the production efforts became less and less fun, these glaring issues became impossible to justify. The terribleness of these movies was evident to the extent that the fourth movie, To Boldly Flee, was essentially about the fact that these movies were not good. The story surrounded a massive rip in space and time called a plot hole, threatening to destroy the universe where all of these reviews took place. It sounds potentially enjoyable, but the film was still obnoxiously pretentious and unself-aware in all the wrong places. So it had the mood of a movie that loves itself, thinks it's self-art, but production efforts from a crew that figured that because the movie was about how it wasn't good, they didn't need to try. To Boldly Flee was almost four hours long and was filmed over the course of seven days. The hell that it must have been to shoot this is unimaginable. By all accounts, filming could go on for as long as 18 hours straight. Long and painful arguments would ensue over very basic elements of filmmaking that everyone should know about, and many people swore off working with Rob and Doug Walker after this production. The main impact of the third film's role on the site was Doug Walker's decision to kill off the nostalgia critic. His final review was of the live-action movie Scooby-Doo, and his character was officially killed off when he entered the plot hole to save the universe. To Boldly Flee was stupid, don't ask me to explain it anymore. It's been pretty consistently stated that the script for To Boldly Flee was finished only two to three weeks before filming began. It was when they were first given the script that the creators on the side learned that the nostalgia critic would be killed off. The film presented this as the end of an era, the age of reviews and of commentary videos, and the script was intended to be an end for every single actor and character featured on screen. To these producers involved in the making of the film, this was a stressful concept dropped in their laps last minute. The channel that facilitated their success was ending their most popular series, and it was doing so with a script that implied that they too would no longer be hosted on the site. But even more controversial was how amazingly unfunny and poorly paced this four-hour experience proved to be. Most controversially, Contributing force Linkara was horrified to discover when reading the script that it included a comedic scene where his character rapes the nostalgia chick. And now, context! 
I do not have the time, and neither do you, audience, for me to give a lengthy diatribe on why using rape or any other kind of a sexual assault in a fictional story can be a really, really bad idea. However, I will link to someone smarter than me on the subject and read an insightful little bit. Take a good look at your story. Why do you think rape is what you need for it to progress? Is there something else that could fill the same function? Unless you have a damn good reason to include rape in a story, you probably shouldn't. These were both creators who made careers out of ripping apart media for poorly illustrating women and victims of abuse. And they were virtually coerced into filming a joke scene where one of them was raping the other one. In the end, it was cut down to Lindsay Ellis just making rape noises off screen. But the fact that Doug Walker still insisted that this joke needed to be in the movie is a huge problem. Perhaps on a real film set, they could have gotten the scene cut altogether. But you get the feeling that there were so many problems with the creation of To Boldly Flee, that to people involved, all of these problems just started to compile into one big pile of useless mush. After the death of the Nostalgia Critic, whose skull was proudly owned by Phelan, the site moved on. Their next notable project involved the creation of an Indiegogo campaign for a game show. Notoriously, the production of this show was so haphazard and horrible that they had to refilm the pilot numerous times, and they only put out 12 of the promised 40 episodes supposedly mostly to avoid an investigation. If you're looking at the show and thinking that it looks terrible, I want to personally know how worse it looks when you know that they spent $90,000 on this. On your marks, get set, a go! Well, my job's done, I hit the on button. <laughs> All right, catch those fish, boys. Within six months, they decided that the death of their flagship series probably wasn't a good idea, and the Nostalgia Critic was brought back. From my experience, many of my personal friends who know anything about Doug's work started watching around this time, mainly because this was the period where Doug officially began uploading his content directly to YouTube. Around this time, Blip.TV had been purchased by Maker Studio, and the video hosting site was shut down by the end of 2015. And as soon as people began uploading their content to YouTube instead of Blip, a surprising thing happened. Creators who had once been vital components to the Channel Awesome Network were suddenly beginning to disappear. What you need to understand is that no one went to Blip.TV and searched for their favorite creators on that site. So in order to get a reasonable amount of views on your video, you had to upload it to a place like ScrewAttack, Atop the Fourth Wall, or Channel Awesome. And because of this very unique situation, none of the creators hosted on the website were actually under contract. They promoted the website by being creators that people came to see, and they were paid through ads on their own videos. And so while it's certainly accurate to say that they worked for thatguywiththeglasses.com, it is not legally accurate to say that they were employed by the website. Because of this, the producers featured on the websites were given no consistent guidelines, and were often treated like replaceable cogs in the machine. Female creators who spoke out about any issue, privately or publicly, were taken far less seriously than their male counterparts, and would often be faced with screaming fits of rage from the CEO of the company. Mike McCod would use intimidation to get his points across, and in many cases, creators were taken off the site without warning just to prove a point. In one case, a beloved and respected content creator on the website was taken off almost immediately for failing to arrive at a Skype call for 15 minutes. A creator who had sunk her own personal money, passion, and time into Doug Walker's vanity projects was fired by a team notorious for ignoring messages for months on end because she wasn't available for a call within a 15-minute window. According to that creator, Obscurus Lupa, this was the fastest that she had ever seen them update the site. I'm bringing this up as the first example because it gives context to why many of the more significant issues with ThatGuyWithTheGlasses.com and ChannelAwesome.com didn't come to surface for many years. Content creators who even poked fun at the works of Doug Walker could face immediate administrative consequences, and people could be removed from the site at any time without any real clear reason. If anyone had tried to expose the website while they were on it, they would have immediately been kicked off with absolutely no consequences for the people running it. Anyways, the people in charge of ThatGuyWithTheGlasses.com ignored several instances of sexual harassment and sexual misconduct under the pretense of keeping up a clean public image. They kept these abusers on the payroll and on the site for years on end despite being alerted to these problems simply because they figured that if it was ignored long enough, it would simply go away. 
There are numerous accounts surrounding problems with Mike Ellis, the site's co-founder. Ellis, a married man, would constantly harass Holly Brown, the site's HR, for refusing to enter a relationship with him. On another occasion, he messaged epic fail showrunner Sean Fenz to do what I can only describe as sexual venting, where he typed out detailed fantasies about what he would do to Sean if given the chance. This went on for about two hours, with Sean never responding once and Ellis just continuously messaging him these things. When Sean told CEO Mike McCod about this, McCod supposedly responded with, God damn it, I told him to stop doing that shit. Ellis was not fired for over a year, and when he was, several members of the That Guy With The Glasses team decided to take Holly Brown to a safe house out of fear that Ellis would come after her. These cases are just as bad as they sound, but those are also the only instances of misconduct in this 69-page document which have names attached to them. Another passage describes a producer on the site with a history of sexually grooming his young female fans. This content creator was supposedly reported to the site, and it took them well over a year to remove him. These people's rights to their own privacy means that we're never going to have all of the hard details on these stories. But take for granted that this part of the video, no matter how long or short I'm able to make it, is more horrible than I could ever portray. To receive complaints of sexual misconduct about the men employed under your site, the men who represent your brand, and to sit on those complaints for years on end, while you left these people in positions of power, under the pretense that if you asked nicely enough, these things would just stop, that is unforgivable. But to then turn around and antagonize female creators, remove one from the site in mere hours because she was 15 minutes late to a Skype call? That raises a lot of questions, is all you can really say. Holly Brown, by the way, the HR, was fired after years of dedicated day-by-day -day work. Weekends, holidays, hospital visits, you name it, she worked that day. She was let go directly after a major surgery and was not given a reason for why she was fired. And in order to receive her servant's pay, she was forced to sign a contract saying that she would not work in that field of expertise for three years. These people fired a chronically impaired woman directly after surgery, but were so afraid of losing her to competitive sites that they forced her to blacklist herself or else she wouldn't be given money that she needed to stay alive. This was directly after they won 90 grand to make a game show, by the way. So they really had a whole domino set of scams lined up. I am now going to read a passage from Channel Awesome's official response to these allegations. Channel Awesome is an organization that respects our producer partners and strives to create the best possible environment for everyone. We welcome a diverse community of people joining together to create great videos. For the people who have spoken out about past instances they deemed harmful or unprofessional, we sincerely regret that you felt that way. We appreciate and hear the frustrations of past producers. We're actively taking internal steps to better improve communication with our producers so they can be focused on putting out their great content. And we're open to constructive criticism, the kind that can help us become even better and serve the needs of our community. But criticism that isn't a mean to a productive end does little for either the party criticizing or those in the line of fire. So it seems like from a PR point of view, this should be something that's easy to fix. Doug Walker walked out of this 69-page document somehow barely being mentioned, although in a 10-year period it's hard to imagine that he didn't know about these things. But the point is that recouping from this should be a possibility. Just fire a few controversial people at the top, hire some new goons, and keep moving. The problem is that this isn't really an option for the company. Mike McCod is without a doubt the most controversial figure still aligned with Channel Awesome. He joined when they needed someone to help create the website, and he allegedly became CEO because no one else wanted to be in charge. He has been referred to as the silent CEO because no one exactly knows what he does other than play video games and occasionally throw hissy fits. He has been described as unprofessional, aggressive, immature, difficult, and misogynistic. 
let's be clear. I've seen people stand up for Mike Ellis. I've seen people defend him, despite everything that he apparently did. I have never, ever seen anyone do the same for Michael McCod. He is that hated. Even if you're going to ignore the obvious examples in this document of him being misogynistic, of him failing to meet any standard for how a professional should act, you can at least admit that he is terrible at his job as the supposed CEO. Michael infamously did not believe in actively recruiting video creators to the channel. In fact, he despised video conventions and didn't think that people should go to them. He wasn't interested in branching the site out to include innovations in the online web, such as streaming, alongside a billion other things that arguably led to the site being left behind in the dirt. The fans and creators of Channel Awesome consistently told those in charge that they needed to strive to innovate, they needed to respect the creator's host on the website, and they needed to run a coherent and professional company, and over and over again consistently, those higher-ups turned and responded, basically, well, the chart says, You are everything that's wrong with entertainment! So like I said, Michael McCod is essentially the most controversial figure on the website, and he's the one that everyone seems to hate. And considering that he apparently doesn't do anything, surely they should just get rid of him and make a statement saying that he's gone. They can't do that. You see, he owns the exclusive rights to the Nostalgia Critic. He somehow convinced them to sign over the exclusive rights to the character, which means that despite the fact that he's a horrible and useless imbecile who does nothing, and has harassed numerous people, and basically is the subject to this huge debate, if they kick him out, their brand ceases to exist. ThatGuyWithTheGlasses.com was a site put together by people who had a dream to build a community, even if they didn't exactly know what they were doing. And they used this sense of a team effort to create a fan base that adored the brand. And the understanding was that as they continued to grow, their increased professionalism would make up for the fact that they didn't initially know what they were doing. Instead, the only thing that disappeared was their respect for anyone involved particularly anyone who had helped them get to where they are today. It's funny to think that when I started uploading reviews to YouTube, I secretly had this hope that one day Channel Awesome would be a place that I could call home. I had this stupid dream that one day I'd be hanging out with Linkara and Lindsay Ellis and Todd in the Shadows and I'd, and I'd be helping out the site in my own way. So to hear that these content creators that I loved and respected were treated like dirt and weren't given the time of day when they were the very reason that people loved the site, well, it's not so awesome. So as a closing statement, I would ask that you guys not antagonize the very few who are still aligned with Channel Awesome. I'm sure they have their own reasons, and if they're going to leave, they will. Second of all, I must directly ask that you don't try to investigate the more sensitive, anonymous details of the document. There's a lot of stuff in that document that I, I couldn't fit into the video in a reasonable time frame, but it does paint a very clear picture of the administration, and I very much suggest you check it out. Thank you so much for watching.